Okay. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the Invasive Species Center webinar series. My name is Deborah Sparks. I am the Business Development and Communications Manager at the Invasive Species Center, and I will be your moderator today. I would like to start with showing respect to and recognizing the long history of Indigenous peoples on whose traditional lands I am speaking to you from today. It is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, home of Garden River First Nation, Batawana First Nation, and the Métis Nation. The Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species in Canada. We've got lots of great resources on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and more. So check us out at invasivespeciescenter.ca. You can also sign up for our newsletter, media and research scan, and event invitations, which is how you can learn about upcoming webinars. The Invasive Species Center is also the Secretariat for ICASE, the International Conference on Aquatic Invasive Species. We are very excited for ICASE 2022, along with our co-hosts, Netherlands Office for Risk Assessment and Research and Belgium's Research Institute for Nature and Forest. ICASE 2022 will be a hybrid event involving sessions that integrate in-person and vir virtual presentations. All registrants, whether attending the conference in person or in Ostend, Belgium or virtually, will be able to participate fully by seeing presentations as delivered in real time, interact with the speakers through facilitated Q&A and network with other attendees. Seven top shelf keynote plenary speakers will de dive deep on important issues related to the conference theme that global climate change amplifies aquatic invasive species impacts. The preliminary program was announced earlier this week and you can find it on the iCase.org website. I'm happy to share that iCase will have four concurrent sessions each day, a special session addressing research at the intersection of climate change, disease and aquatic invasive species, a session honoring the legacy of Dr. Olaf Whale, and a workshop to share knowledge on how COVID-19 impacted work in aquatic systems and management of aquatic invasive species. There is also an exciting field tour planned in Belgium and the Netherlands for the Saturday following the conference, and you can indicate your interests on iCase.org. Before we get started with today's webinar, I would like to note that there will be time for questions at the end of the two presentations. So if you have a question at any time, please type it in the question box and I will direct it to that presenter after the conclusion of both talks. Beyond questions, there is also a chat function where you are welcome to say hello, introduce yourself and chat during the event. If you are having technical difficulties at any time, please type them in the question box and we will try to resolve it for you. A recording of this webinar will also be available on our website afterwards that you can watch. Lastly, there will be a very brief survey following the webinar. If you could take some time to fill it out, we would welcome your feedback. Today's webinar is titled Belgium and the Netherlands, ICASE 2022 host countries and aquatic invasion hotspots. I am pleased to introduce our speakers, Dr. Leo Nagelkerke of Wageningen University in the Netherlands, and Tim Adriens of the Research Institute for Nature and Forest in Belgium. Leo's main research interest is the structure and functioning of fish communities under stress, with an emphasis on trophic interactions. Tim's research focuses on invasive species management in the broadest sense, from prevention to control, specifically on the EU invasive species regulation. Thank you for joining us, Tim and Leo. I'm going to pass things over to our first speaker, Leo Nagelkerke. Thank you, uh, Deborah. Deb, I'm trying to uh, start my presentation now. Oops. Oh, this is not an idea. You think you've prepared everything very well, and then you get this, of course. So that's the usual thing. So, uh, well, 
Welcome everybody. My name is uh, Leo Nagelkerke and I work at the uh, Wageningen University. And basically I'm a fish biologist and uh, uh, I do work with alien species too, a bit. And uh, my purpose of this, uh, of this session, of, the, of this, this presentation is basically to give you a bird's eye view of uh, uh, some of the problems that we have in the Netherlands and Belgium in the low countries, if you like, with uh, uh, alien species. Uh, a bit of the lay of the land here is uh, Western Europe, and you see uh, the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg, the low countries lying in the middle. And if you look at these countries in a bit tilted way, then you'll see that they are actually one big delta. You see there's a, uh, a delta with, with estuaries and large rivers coming into the North Sea, so it is very much uh, water dominated. It is all in all a low-lying uh, delta area, and it is very much uh, dominated by four large rivers. Uh, the, um, uh, the Rhine River is the biggest, that's in yellow on the left. And then we have the Meuse in green, the Scheldt in blue, and a bit of the Ems, which is mostly uh, German, but also partly of the, of the Netherlands. So large rivers are dominating uh, the area. This part of the world is also one of the most densely populated parts of the world. You'll see that here, uh, both Flanders, Belgium, and the Netherlands have very high uh, population densities. Uh, uh, also on, on a worldwide scale, it's probably one of the most densely populated parts of the, of the world. And with that comes a strong fragmentation uh, of the landscape. To the right, you see uh, different parts uh, different land uses, if you like, of, of the Netherlands. And you see it's, it's really, really speckled. It's all very small. And uh, what is important, uh, I don't have this for Flanders, but it is probably quite similar. Uh, if you look at the light green, that is agricultural land. So still agricultural land is a very large part of the, um, of the country. And agricultural land, uh, this is a typical example, uh, uh, is very much uh, uh, human dominated and very strongly modified. So we have a very fragmented and strongly human modified uh, landscape. And that landscape fragmentation uh, can also be quantified. And also here you see that on a, on a map again, a quantification of fragmentation, you see that Flanders and the Netherlands is actually uh, one of the most fragmented parts of, of Europe in terms of, of landscape. And there's a lot of water in that landscape, but also another aspect of it is that most of our water bodies, more than 90% on average, uh, are not in good ecological status or, uh, or, or, in, uh, good, or with good ecological potential in, in, in rivers and lakes, according to this, uh, this map. So all in all, what you'll see is a strongly human dominated, fragmented landscape with, well, mostly not very good ecological quality in the water bodies. And these freshwater water bodies are very important. If you look in the Netherlands, for instance, in the left map, you can see uh, uh, the, the surface area of, uh, of water bodies. Around 18% of the total surface area of the Netherlands is, uh, is water bodies. Uh, the large rivers are quite uh, clearly to be seen and also some, some lakes. And this is the, the, the overall uh, surface area. And to the right, you see the ditch density or the number of ditches. And the darker blue it is the more ditches you have. And, and ditches and canals are very important in the, in the especially in the Dutch uh, uh, landscape. And um, uh, th those water bodies are very important also for the spread of, uh, of alien species. To give you some uh, some more pictures of the of the type of landscape, this is some um, uh, pictures of the uh, the river landscape. On the top right, you see the Grensmaas, that's on the border between Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, and this is a well, I would say a typical Dutch Belgium landscape with the, the river. To the right, you see the uh, the dike uh, of the. Um, uh, um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the river, the river dike that is actually protecting the land for flooding, not always successful like we saw last uh, last summer. Uh, and the, uh, the area in between the river and the dike is a former floodplain. And as you can see, it's been used for agriculture quite a lot. For the rest, what you can see, it's quite large scale if you look at the large rivers uh, to the left, but also that the banks, the embankment of the river is often strengthened by stones, which do not naturally occur there. So there's a lot of habitat uh, um, uh, habitat alteration and in the right bottom you can see that even stronger that this is in an urban area so there are also other ways of um, or other interests basically there also it, it should look attractive but it is far from natural uh, 
let me put it like that. So this is the, the large rivers. And if you go to the other imported water bodies, these are, these are what I would call typical Dutch uh, uh, pictures, actually. Small canals and ditches, because when I talk about ditches, also this is called a ditch or a small canal. Um, those are mostly optimized for uh, draining the land, meaning that they're often straight, pretty deep, don't have a very interesting profile and uh, they're cleaned every year of water plants. So it's, it's, it's continuously uh, being disturbed as well. So highly fragmented, relatively low ecological quality and lots of it of this water. And uh, uh, so all these, these uh, uh, especially the, the, this um, um, disturbance of the habitat is of course uh, often uh, quite quite good for the spread of, of alien species. And another thing is that uh, all of these water bodies in, in Flanders and the Netherlands are very well connected with the rest of Europe. What you see here is the uh, amount of transport over the rivers in, um, in Europe. And you see that the Netherlands and Belgium are colored dark blue. There's a lot of transport over the Rhine River, but also the Rhine River is now connected to, uh, for instance, the Danube uh, Basin. Three of the four major ports in terms of, uh, of freight are actually situated in the area where we're talking about, that we're talking about Rotterdam, Antwerp and Amsterdam are all in that same, uh, same area. So there's a lot of trade. A lot of trade means a lot of goods, but also live animals are being traded. And of course you have the, uh, the, the, the aspect of ballast water, which uh, um, uh, can also be used as a spread for alien species. And this connectivity has increased dramatically over the last 200 years, especially uh, halfway the, uh, the 20th century, you saw an enormous increase of the, the catchment area connected to the Rhine River Basin, which is also uh, increasing the potential for the spread of, uh, of alien species. And next to that, it is still very easy to get alien species in the Netherlands. Uh, if, you, if you just scan the internet for five minutes and you say, I want to buy a, a Russian sturgeon or a grass carp, you can find it easily. And they'll, uh, uh, if you pay, they'll send it to you uh, uh, straight, uh, straight ahead. So it's, uh, it's really easy to get. Uh, lots of people keep those fishes in ponds, etc. And once they're there, they'll, they, they'll end up in the, um, uh, in the open water in, in nature, if you like. Uh, crayfish are not, uh, another thing. I quite uh, I, I looked at I looked it up, and what I found striking is that it's easy to buy these uh, these foreign crayfish, these alien crayfish. Not even the species is indicated in many cases. It's just crayfish. You can buy them. You can put them in your pond, and when you get when you when you don't like them anymore, you just throw them out in the ditch so they can spread nicely. Okay, so that's that that's the uh, the situation uh, as a potential hotspot for the spread of, uh, of aliens. I want to zoom in on three uh, examples now of, uh, of uh, the in invasive animals in the Netherlands. First of all, in uh, mollusks, this, this picture was provided, the, the graph was provided by Frank Collas. We have around 75 species of uh, native freshwater mollusks in the Netherlands. And this is uh, uh, the number of uh, the development of the number of alien species over time. The first alien already came in in the 19th century, early in the 19th century, the, the zebra mussel, Dracaena polymorpha. Um, the New Zealand mud snail is also a, a one that was already there quite, uh, quite early, and Asian clams have come later. And as you see, there's quite a steep increase still in the, in the, in the last years of, uh, of alien mollusks coming into, um, into the Netherlands. And of course, they're ecosystem engineers. The idea of, uh, of Dreisenitz that they are, can, can actually clean uh, water bodies was for the Netherlands at the time even an attractive idea. Uh, there were some plans, and I don't know whether they actually uh, uh, executed those plans to actually introduce purposefully uh, Dreisenitz and some water bodies to clear them up because uh, al al algal infestations were a big problem in the, in the Netherlands because of eutrophication. Don't know if they ever did that, but what you see is they 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 can clear up quite a, a, a large volumes of water, uh, but they can also infest other shells. Like in, in the picture on the right, you see a anodonta shell being uh, uh, infested with uh, with dracaenids, and once that happens, the growth of um, 
uh, of these shells is, is, is stalling. As you can see in the, in the graph on the left, the red squares are uh, the growth of, uh, of Anodonta when they're infested with, um, uh, with Dreisenids and the blue diamonds are without it. So you can see there's a, a decreased growth and also real smothering of these um, uh, shells has been, has been reported. So they, there's real competition uh, in a way. One thing that, um, uh, 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 that stimulates the spread of these alien mollusks is again, this artificial habitat here you see to the left again, the, uh, the, the stony embankments. And another thing is that this is probably going to become worse when, uh, uh, when, the, when the warming uh, of, because of climate change is increasing. Uh, in the uh, picture on the right, uh, you'll see the uh, two curves. That's the curves indicating a potentially not occurring fraction of species. So when temperature goes up, uh, a larger proportion of species will disappear. But the uh, yellow line, sorry, the blue line is the one of the, uh, the native species, the red line of the alien species. And you see that for the alien species, they can actually stand much higher temperatures. So with uh, climate warming, it is, well, to be expected that a number of alien mollusks will further increase. Then a short bit about the um, uh, crayfish. In Western Europe, there used to be only one species, Astacus astacus, that became very rare or even got extinct in many places because of um, uh, the, uh, the crayfish plague. But now we have quite a large number of, uh, of alien species, most of them from, uh, from North America, not all. And in a recent paper, it's been shown what the, the, what the, the, the upsurge basically of these crayfish has been shown. And also these animals can act as ecosystem engineers. They're uh, digging in the banks, uh, which can have uh, well, quite a bad effect on these, uh, all these ditches that I showed you before. They compete with uh, uh, indigenous species, not so much crayfish, but other uh, macrofauna and even with fish. They prey on macrofauna. Uh, they uh, eat a lot of plants too, some of these species. And of course, the pathogen transmission is a, uh, a problem. And as a last example, uh, something on fishes, we have around 45 native species originally in, in the Netherlands and uh, in, in Belgium, which is a very low number of species. Western Europe is pretty depauperate uh, if it comes to its ichthyofauna. But if you look at the number of alien fish species, it's approaching 30, meaning that a third to almost half, well, more than a third of the species by now that we have in the Netherlands are of, uh, of alien uh, origin. And the opening of the Main Danube Canal around 1990, 1992, has increased uh, quite a, uh, has increased uh, uh, the, the number of alien species being introduced in, uh, in Western Europe. Many of them, them are gobies, of which round goby, of course, is a very uh, uh, well-known example. And if you look at the origin of alien species in, uh, in the Netherlands, the Pontocaspian gobies that were introduced uh, not on purpose, but uh, uh, by accident, were is actually the, the largest number. Uh, North American species are also around seven species, but most of these were actually introduced uh, purposefully in um, uh, in the Netherlands. Okay, what these effects are? Uh, there's already quite a lot of um, uh, uh, publications on the effects of round goby, for instance, on uh, on native bullheads. In, uh, in the Netherlands, that's a protected species. Uh, the graphs there on the right side, they show you um, the situation uh, before. That's the, oh, in both graphs, it's the, uh, the density of, uh, of bullheads is shown. In green, before the um, uh, upsurge of, uh, of round goby in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, the top graph shows you a, a, a situation where uh, Round goby was actually present. So you see the green bars there that was in 2009 and 2011 and the red bars hardly hardly visible is the density of um, uh, of bullheads after the introduction of um, uh, of round goby. And you see that where they are present hardly any bullheads are left. And in the bottom graph which, which is a control you'll see that uh, this difference is not so large. You see a small difference between before and after, but in this situation, round goby was not present. So this is clearly uh, uh, indicating that round goby has quite a deleterious effect on the density of, uh, of bullheads. So there's a, there's a problem there. 
and uh, I take your liberty now to, 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 to show you some of the work that I'm personally much interested in, because one of the things I'm looking for is, is it trophic interactions that are actually uh, causing this, this effect of gobies on, uh, on the bullheads. And I studied that by looking at uh, feed, feeding associated morphological, uh, morphological traits. And um, I'm not going to uh, talk too much about the details of this graph, but what you see there on the left is the, um, uh, the feeding space that is be taken up by several species. And what we found there is actually that uh, native species and alien species sometimes overlap, so there's potential competition. But what you also see is that some of the alien species are actually taking up feeding spaces that are not taken up before. So they are, seem to be filling up uh, vacant niches. So it is not so straightforward what the cause is of the, uh, the impact of uh, alien species on the, uh, on the food web. Well, then uh, I'd like to um, say something about some of the dilemmas that you have, especially when you're talking about the, um, um, uh, the management of fish populations. Connectivity is a big thing now. Uh, fish, the, the Global Swimways Project, fish migration around the globe gets a lot of attention and, and rightfully so, I should say. Um, and in the Netherlands, that's been taken, uh, taken on uh, uh, quite, quite, quite largely, uh, I must say, by many people, um, because we do have a lot of water bodies and there's a lot of interconnection, but still for many fishes, the, the interconnection is not so good because we have many weirs and dams in our, uh, in our water bodies too. And so uh, uh, a lot of water bodies in the Netherlands uh, are not connected to the sea. You can see it on the left, the purple ones don't have any connection to the sea whatsoever. So a lot of fish passages have been projected. Uh, in green, yellow and, uh, and blue are the, the, the fish passages that are either already realized or that are being planned. And you see this is a large scale operation actually connecting most of the water bodies to each other and to the sea. But there can be uh, some kind of tension there with alien species management that has already been uh, discussed in many, in many studies. Uh, if you have particular fish passages, it can also stimulate the spread of, uh, of alien species. This is, a, uh, uh, this is, this is taken from a, uh, a paper by uh, Frank Rahel, uh, showing uh, and, and asking actually the question, is there any optimization there between the level of connectivity that you want if you look at connectivity and the ecological quality for fish on the on one side and the spread of aliens on the, uh, on the other side? So I think this is a discussion we really have to make. Um, an example of this is uh, given to me by uh, Hugo Verrijke. Uh, to, to the left, you see the Meuse River, and uh, uh, this is a tributary of the, uh, uh, of the Meuse River, the Berwijn River. And the round goby was already occurring in the Meuse, but upstream, uh, uh, you, you can see the arrows indicating where the river is actually uh, going underneath the road. There was a barrier which prevented round goby to go further upstream. But the managers decided that actually the barrier had to go and it was taken away as far as I understood. And now round goby has uh, gone even further upstream. And you, you might ask yourself whether that was a good idea. There's another thing with, uh, with alien species and uh, I'm talking about the Dutch situation, uh, about the Dutch situation now. Uh, the public opinion is very important. To the top left, you see a, a goldfish, a nice goldfish. And to the right of that, you see a professional fisherman trying to get out around a thousand goldfish from a canal in the city of Arnhem, uh, because all these goldfish were released there by a, a local person who thought it was a nice site to have nice goldfish in, in, in the city without any realization that this is, of course, a, an alien species. Uh, he probably meant well, but it was not a good idea. On the other side, we have a very nice native predatory fish, the Wells catfish that is spreading nowadays in the, in the Netherlands. And people are a bit scared of that. Uh, in Dutch, it says there there's a, a, a pest of catfish in the Achterhoek, which is a part of the, of the Netherlands. They eat a whole duck uh, in, at once, uh, in, one, in one bite. And my little dog is not allowed to go into the water anymore. That's what it, that's what it says. So uh, this is a native species but is considered a kind of monster so people will usually prefer petable, ali a uh, petable aliens versus uh, native monsters so public opinion is important especially when you want to do something about uh, uh, 
preventing the spread of, um, uh, of aliens. Public uh, uh, highlighted some of these uh, things in this study. Public awareness of non-native species does not correlate with the actual ecological risks. That was one thing that struck me. And also there's a clear bias toward knowledge on terrestrial species compared with aquatic. So there's work for us to do there. Uh, but a, a bit, well, I didn't like that, that very much. It says in isolation, scientific research has a negligible impact on public opinion. So that means there's actually quite a lot of work to be, uh, to be done, especially if you also read things like the, ri the rise of, spe uh, of alien species denialism, uh, where people are downplaying the problems that can be the effect of, uh, of alien species. And also in the Netherlands, that is definitely a, uh, a problem. There's one solution to that problem. If you want to really get rid of a particular alien species, you should just spread the rumor that they are touching the dikes, because you see here the Netherlands on the, on the, uh, at a high water. This is actually not, not exceptional. This is a, no disaster or anything. The dikes are holding. Uh, but we have this nice alien called a muskrat. And uh, if it's about public opinion, uh, the Dutch know that muskrats are bad for their dikes. So no matter how fluffy you are, we'll try and catch you all. Uh, as you can see in this graph, this is the muskrat, uh, muskrat catches over time. And they're actually doing quite a good job, if you like, in, in, in exterminating most of the muskrats over time. And with that, I would like to stop uh, with great thanks to Frank Kollas, Rob Leuven, and Hugo Verrijker for giving me a lot of input. Thank you, Leo, so much for a great presentation and a great overview of what's happening in the Netherlands. Uh, next, I'm going to hand things over to Tim Adriens with a reminder that we will have a Q&A session with both speakers after Tim's presentation. You all seeing this? Hello, good afternoon. Um, the idea is, of course, to get you to ICAIS uh, in Ostend, um, if not for this uh, fantastic um, genderella, which is a lovely potion uh, containing a number of uh, highly invasive plant species like Japanese knotweed and giant hogweed, then maybe you want to see for yourself that what is advertised about Belgium and Flanders in in-flight magazines is really true. And um, my uh, introduction will uh, share some similarities with what Leo has said um, about the Netherlands, of course. We are renowned for our sheer absence of um, decent spatial planning um, and our bad taste in housing. But um, some of you might also know that actually our coast also has uh, one of the most pristine uh, dune systems in Europe. And uh, I would really recommend if you come to Ostend you take the tram and go west or east um, to visit some of them. Now we are indeed a very um, densely populated area. Um, we have very bad spatial planning, 26% of build-up land um, and an incredible uh, population density. We're a logistical hub, as Leo's explained, with all the harbors and points of entry that we have. And our natural areas, um, albeit a few exceptions, we even have one national park in the east but they are mostly very small and vulnerable uh, and surrounded by houses uh, and infrastructure. And in terms of the hydrographic network, we probably have one of the densest in the world. And our trade relations, uh, well, we have trade relations with all the continents in the world, hence uh, an incredible amount of species since the 50s um, coming in. As you can see also in our floras, um, we are actually uh, at the top in Europe in terms of the level of invasion. So we're really an invasion hotspot. And I want to exemplify this um, for the aquatic realm, showing you some examples of uh, management issues uh, we are trying to, to tackle, how we are trying to tackle some of those invasives. This is actually the uh, same image taken from a report from the European Commission. We now have an EU regulation, which regulates a number of alien species, and we are at the, the very top in Europe. If you consider both um, established and casual alien species, we're even uh, the top ranking country in Europe in terms of the presence of those 
high impact invasive aliens. And I remind you that about 50% of the species on that list, which currently contains about 66 species, are aquatic freshwater um, animals and plants. Now, just showing you a few images of what our landscapes look like, navigable canals, uh, highly human influenced and modified, um, very straight uh, with artificial banks, but also some quite pristine, um, mostly upstream areas where the water is very clear and we still have uh, some rare fish and freshwater species in general. Some marshes, um, that are also important for our cities not to be flooded uh, and very nice heathland areas actually uh, for instance in the campaign area with uh, high degrees high levels of biodiversity now taking a look at our uh, register of introduced and invasive species um, you can see that the trends both in freshwater marine and estuarine um, is the same and in the last decades, we are seeing actually no saturation in uh, numbers of alien species arriving um, in Flanders. And both the rate and the number are increasing. Not so for the marine. Um, there is a fabulous book that just um, uh, has appeared, uh, which was published by the Flemish Marine Institute, which is, by the way, just right next to the venue of ICAIS 2022. And I would really recommend you visit there. Um, you can see that actually in terms of the number of new alien species in the marine, uh, we're doing a bit better in the last years. This probably has to do with um, altered shipping uh, routes. We did ratify the Ballast Water Convention a few years ago, but I think it's still early days to see uh, the effect of that. Now, how do these uh, freshwater invaders uh, come in? They come in through a range of pathways, as you can see. Um, and uh, note the importance of the escape pathway. And to exemplify this, you would be surprised what kind of organisms you can find out there. This is one of the world's, uh, the world's worst invasive species, the cane toad, uh, world famous. It's been introduced across the world for uh, biocontrol in, in, in sugarcane and apparently some people uh, find it nice and interesting to keep these kind of animals um, as pets even if they are highly poisonous. Now this one uh, was shot by a hunter um, who believed it was a giant toad that uh, he should kill immediately so um, this one will not it's not an established species and this kind of thing is probably a bit underestimated um, this Iberian rip newt, for instance, is a species that actually thrives in, in Iberia and the more arid parts of Iberia. Um, and uh, there below on the left, you find Triturus marmoratus, which is a species with a more uh, central European Mediterranean uh, distribution. And each time, well, sometimes you, you, can, uh, you can remove them quickly. But actually, it exemplifies this problem of uh, people keeping pets and dumping them into the environment, which is not a very animal friendly thing to do. Um, and also um, inherently uh, holds dangers to the environment. I just want to mention that um, to tackle this problem, we need to communicate better with the public and people keeping and holding pets. And recently, an important initiative has started um, by the European Commission to uh, put the pet trade sector together and tackle this problem through uh, better communication. Now, all these uh, alien species present in freshwater environments and also terrestrial, they uh, cause a lot of management costs. And I want to just take you through some of them. Now, let's start with one of our longest standing um, eradications, uh, and that's muskrat, the muskrat that Leo has already been talking about. This problem uh, actually um, started to be tackled in, in, the, thir in the 30s already um, and has incredibly professionalized. And currently, um, muskrat eradication uh, is doing pretty well. On that map, uh, you can see that um, actually our efforts to uh, still trap them are concentrated uh, around the border. So we're effectively managing uh, the Flemish region as a pestry area for muskrats coming in from the Netherlands, from Wallonia, from France. 
Um, but this is really working well. Uh, it's purely mechanical. We're using coni bear traps. Uh, we're not using rodenticides anymore. And uh, we're trapping a few thousands per year. Uh, here and there, if we, if we do not control them, uh, in some years we have a bit more, but uh, it's nothing compared to the hundreds of thousands of rats we had um, at the height of the project uh, of this program in, in the 80s and the 90s. And we're also collaborating with uh, our neighbors in the north um, in this, this uh, live project, which is called uh, MICA, Management of Koi Pew and Muskrat in Europe. Uh, where we're trying to tackle um, these semi-aquatic rodents uh, with a number of innovations. And you can see there that uh, we are doing some research on the sides uh, of that management program uh, using intelligent traps, um, traps that are equipped with wildlife cameras that can actually um, activate the trap when the camera says, okay, this is a muskrat and not a native species. And we're also using uh, eDNA, um, to actually move towards a more active uh, trapping regime where we're only putting traps when muskrats are present. And um, this eDNA is really something that uh, is thriving for the moment and that uh, we're hoping to, to develop in, in, in future years. And another example where we've used it is this incursion of African clawed frog um, on our southern borders. Uh, we discovered a small population in France in a pond and uh, we've immediately uh, done an eDNA campaign uh, uh, on our territory and also our room colleagues have engaged in that um, to be able to quickly detect uh, this very hard to detect species. Another invasive amphibian that we are quite famous for is the uh, American bullfrog. Uh, it's native um, to the east of the Rocky Mountains um, in the USA, and uh, it's a voracious predator. Um, it carries disease like chytrid fungus and ranavirus, and um, we are trying to tackle it uh, in various ways. You can see here that it's mostly spread um, in the Valley of the Nete, um, and this is the kind of habitat that you can expect. The area has a sandy soil. It's a bit warmer there climatically than the rest uh, of the region. And um, when you look at it on the map, this is really a typical habitat for bullfrog. It's a pondscape with uh, a patchwork of, uh, uh, of ponds uh, close to one another. There is a river uh, in between as a dispersal corridor for the larvae. And uh, this is really uh, horrible to start managing because um, it's mostly all private terrain. Uh, so we need like uh, differentiated management regimes in different areas. And um, it's really difficult because um, these guys show high density dependence. If you take out the larvae, the rest of them have more space and periphyton to feed on. And if you take out the adults, then you release the metamorph, that's the dispersal stage, from predation. So what is actually happening is that you are speeding up this cycle. And instead of uh, doing their metamorphosis in two years, they will do it in one year because they have enough food and space to do so. There's also a kind of facilitation with invasive fish, um, like topmouth gudgeon there, and pumpkin seed, they are taking out a lot of the macroinvertebrates, beetle larvae, dragonfly larvae, that should actually predate on uh, the tadpoles. So you get a facilitation with invasive fish. So how to tackle that? Well, sometimes you have the means and the time and the will to, um, to do some drastic uh, habitat management, uh, basically pond destruction. Um, but sometimes you have to uh, refer to more manual methods like uh, sand netting or using fike netting to try and tackle them, which is very labor intensive if you want to get uh, a flexible amphibian like this one uh, below a certain threshold where it causes damage to native amphibians and biota. Um, in places where we can't do this, uh, we're trying to propagate what we call the whole ecosystem approach. Um, and the idea is here that we actually introduce native predators like perch or, or pike into that system. And what you then get is actually a more interesting, uh, higher ecological quality 
aquatic system where you have less algal blooms, uh, less turbidity, more uh, macrophytes on the bottom. And as you can see here on this graph, um, this is research uh, performed by uh, Hirat Witt uh, some years ago. You can see that um, it's really uh, having an effect. The direct predation of tadpoles is causing them to uh, have it almost as a log scale, so a tenfold uh, decrease in the number of tadpoles there. Of course, the number of uh, adults uh, didn't change very much, but um, the side effects on uh, the ecosystem were actually very positive. And some people go one step further, um, and I'm referring to this another life project in Belgium um, that my institute is involved in, um, and also this uh, lady here who's actually uh, been able to produce a triploids bullfrog um, and is trying uh, the sterile male release um, in field conditions currently. So we're very much looking forward to see the results of that. Invasive macrophytes are probably taking the bulk of um, the management means uh, in my country. It's species like New Zealand pygmy weed, floating pennywort, uh, water primrose, cabomba, uh, lagrosiphon. Many of these species are probably familiar to you because they are native in your area. Uh, and there's also some very long established species already, um, Azola, for instance. Uh, but also the Elodia species, Natali and Canadensis, uh, are long established and actually considered naturalized. Um, Hydrocotyle, for instance, was introduced as an oxygenating plant. Um, it was a scientific experiment and uh, currently is being controlled by, by hand pulling mechanical removal, um, which is working quite well. And more and more species are coming, and I would like to um, refer to the Life Reparias project, which is going to be present uh, with a large delegation at the conference. And if you're interested to know how we drafted alert lists for species uh, invasive aquatic macrophytes, in this case, that we do not have yet, but that we are expecting to arrive uh, shortly in our area, then uh, please don't miss this talk. Um, for some of these aquatic macrophytes like um, Azala filiculoides, um, we were lucky because uh, the predator, uh, the herbivore, uh, in this case Azala weevil, was co-introduced with it and uh, as a consequence um, this uh, duckweed-like uh, plant species actually shows more of a boom and bust um, cycles in, in our area. And you can see the before and the after. So this, this beetle is doing a good job. But this was an accidental uh, biocontrol experiment, we could say. In fact, there is no biocontrol uh, in my area for uh, other species currently. It's something that the Netherlands are looking into. Um, and biocontrol is relatively big in the UK. But on the European mainland, only in Portugal, there are a few experiments. But uh, not yet in Northwest Europe. So this is something that we probably need in coming years. Now, other plants um, are not controlled uh, biologically. Uh, this is Cabomba. It's a species not, uh, yet, not yet widely established uh, in our area, but uh, it's starting to spread in the east, as you can see, contrary to the Netherlands, where it's much more uh, abundant. And in this case, um, we had to uh, take some drastic measures and uh, actually remove the whole substrate with all the plant propagules in it um, and dispose of it. Um, it's rapid response, um, but it's not uh, without work and without uh, appropriate means, of course. Now, in this example um, of duckweed blooms relates to the topic of the conference, how uh, climate change actually um, aggravates this problem of invasive species. It's something we see more and more um, in the latest years, duckweed blooms, and they are especially a nuisance in navigable uh, canals and waterways and also for recreation uh, and angling. Um, and the managers of these waterways are, uh, well, this is an example of a Flemish uh, manager of the navigable uh, waterways and canals. They are removing about 100 tons a day in August um, uh, and um, 
this keeps on going and going and, and is something that we can expect uh, to see more and more in coming years. It also explains that or, or illustrates that actually a lot of our waters uh, have very high nutrient loads in phosphorus and, uh, and nitrates and um, these species are able to exploit that and uh, take a competitive advantage and so it's an interplay between having high nutrient loads and probably a bit of climate change, which is causing ox ox oxygen levels uh, to change in the water column. And we'll probably see more of that in coming years. One species that um, is causing a lot of uh, headaches to many uh, conservation managers currently is New Zealand pyg pygmy wheat. Um, and you can see uh, it's a species from, it comes from New Zealand. Um, it spreads by boots, by waterfowl, um, by horses, and actually it can uh, form these dense mats where nothing can, can grow. And we really uh, are wondering what to do with it. Um, and they have the same problem in the Netherlands, so luckily we are not alone. And if you look at it from a European perspective, it's still relatively confined to Northwest Europe. And there's going to be a fabulous talk, I'm sure, at uh, the conference on how they tackled it on the Wadden Islands. Um, uh, it's a, it's been a massive project for uh, cross lot removal there, and I really recommend you to go and watch that. I won't talk a lot about invasive fish, but this is an example of the oriental weather loach, which is causing trouble for our protected native species, Myconus uh, fossilis. Um, and as you can see, uh, a life project is in the making uh, to try and tackle that, and it's using eDNA. Um, and you could wonder, uh, this is an image from uh, the inundations in July uh, in the south of Belgium, but of course you can wonder what this kind of disaster means in terms of um, moving biota around uh, to all kinds of places. And I have not talked about uh, the little critters yet, but there are a lot, especially in the uh, Skeld estuary. Uh, we are confronted with a lot of uh, these little critters, benthic macroinvertebrates. And here on this map, you see some sampling points um, where they have been looked into. Um, on the simple graphs, you see that it's mostly mollusks and crustaceans, and that a lot of them come from North America. Crayfish, Leo's already mentioned it. Um, I think we almost have as much crayfish, alien crayfish, as the Netherlands. A few species are still lacking, but we know for sure that they are coming. Uh, one of our latest acquisitions is that very nice one on the right uh, hand side there. It's Brocambaris acutus. And there are really ecosystem engineers and also spreading crayfish plague. Uh, but our Astacus Astacus already got extinct in the 50s. There are plans to um, perhaps reintroduce them and uh, rear them again and to select for some more um, crayfish plague resistant strains. But maybe considering the scale of the problem and also the ecological amplitude that these species have, you can see for marbled crayfish, a parthenogenetic species that uh, comes from the aquarium trait on the right hand side, the kind of habitats it can survive in, they can be highly artificial and, and really urbanized. So maybe we have to think of uh, moving towards a strategy where we, if we can't beat them, um, we eat them. Um, but we all know that commercial harvesting is not the silver bullet for invasive species control. But in some cases, it might perhaps um, make some difference. And there are a lot of those uh, macroinvertebrates, uh, mollusks, etc., are actually uh, left unmanaged. Um, on the left hand side, you have uh, Sinanodonta udiana, an Asian species which is already much more widespread than shown on that picture. It's moving to the west. On the right hand side, you have the spectacular um, um, species uh, from China, the Chinese mystery snail um, that we have in the east. And together with the Netherlands, probably we have the sole populations uh, in Europe. So um, people keep dumping these uh, animals in the uh, environment, and that's problematic and very hard to tackle um, in the case of mollusks.
invasive waterfowl. Uh, now, sometimes you can just shoot them, uh, like for the sacred ibis and the ruddy duck, which is almost eradicated in Europe. Uh, I'll bite some, uh, some birds that are still uh, in the Netherlands. Um, Egyptian goose we can trap, and there's programs to um, round up Canada goose during the mold, which is uh, really uh, something that we have been working on the last 10 years uh, at a vast scale and is actually working very well. Um, we know from uh, counts and models that we run that we have about halved the population um, compared to the level of 2010. Mitten crabs, um, they do a spectacular uh, upstream migration in May. Um, they spawn in the estuary, and then when they hit uh, an obstacle, like a wall, a house, or infrastructure, they are causing nuisance to people, and we are trying to mitigate that using uh, these plastic screens, for instance, or we have to refer to active trapping. And the people from the Flemish Environment Agency have come up with this uh, incredible innovation. It's actually a modified, uh, um, well, a trap that uh, you put uh, on the river and with which you can, like a post box, uh, during the migration, um, remove tons and tons of crabs. Uh, and this way you actually create an upstream freed, uh, an upstream area freed of crabs during the migration. Um, and there are plans to build a few more of these devices. So it's interesting developments uh, to see happening currently. Conservation paradoxes, as Leo has mentioned, um, Dresena mussels, they have a tendency to, uh, to be biofilters and to uh, clean the water, actually. In some cases, people are starting to say that the water is too clean um, and not natural anymore. But in many places, we have to acknowledge that uh, thanks to these mollusks, actually a lot of our artificial water bodies are actually in a good ecological status. So conservation paradoxes and how to deal with those. Also trade-offs. Um, if we remove uh, invasive species uh, like we've done here, then sometimes we are facilitating others. So how do we make these choices? It's something that um, invasion managers are confronted with. In some cases, um, we can give the natives a head start, such as here in the dunes, uh, where we planted marine grass after invasive shrub removal. Um, and probably as invasion managers, we need to think more and talk more about, uh, about this with uh, restoration people in coming years. Um, now, what are we doing to, to tackle all of this? We're very good at citizen science and using the internet. Um, Together with an NGO called Naturpunt, we have an early warning system where naturalists uh, can report invasive species. As you can see um, from this graph uh, in the framework of the re reporting for the regulation, uh, since 2010, the citizen science contingent in those data is becoming more and more important. And at the European level, if we make a comparison, of course, we have a kind of a supremacy uh, of the United Kingdom in this. But Belgium is uh, not doing so bad at all in terms of uh, the number of citizen science projects on alien species. And we can use those data also to run complicated models that um, do some time series analysis and identify quickly uh, new emerging uh, upcoming alien species. It's something we're going to be looking at in future years. The EU regulation. Um, has meant an incredible uh, progress in terms of um, the capacity and also the thinking about uh, invasive alien species in my country. It's driving surveillance and management activities and also driving prevention. We're starting to think about uh, making some real choices in which species we want to manage and how we want to do that. And we're also uh, currently writing um, uh, pathway action plans, uh, things about prevention, awareness raising, uh, biosecurity, and we have a national scientific secretariat working hard on that. So in conclusion, I would say um, we surely have good risk assessment protocols, good surveillance and incredible data systems, but in terms of management, we can do better. Um, and we have to um, 
um, inform uh, the people a bit more. Uh, invasion literacy is probably generally quite low and we need to uh, think about uh, working better on biosecurity in coming years. And I will finish uh, by showing you uh, our latest live project. Um, it's in the center of Belgium and uh, it's a project on aquatic macrophyte management and crayfish management in three river basins where we really want to uh, try and tackle it uh, across our language border. And if all of this is not enough to get you to ICAIS, then uh, I can tell you that Austin is also uh, the birthplace of uh, James Ensor. It's probably another thing that Belgium is famous for, surrealist painters. Uh, and this one, uh, James makes uh, very nice paintings, so really recommend the museum. And it's also the birthplace of Arno Hentjens, um, which is a very famous Belgian singer. It's probably one of the last rockers that we have. Um, and uh, he shows a striking resemblance actually with our main conference organizer, especially when he's putting up his uh, cowboy hat. I thank uh, all of these people and institutions that um, we work with in the last uh, 20 years almost. And uh, I also want to thank you for, your, for being here and your attention today. Thank you, Tim. Um, oh, it was great to see Hugo and his twin. Uh, excellent overview of the state of aquatic invasives in Belgium. I'm really enjoying this advanced look at our ICASE 2022 uh, host countries, and it's giving us a flavor of the great talks to expect at the conference, as I noticed that many of the authors cited are also giving presentations on the program. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, and we have time for a few questions. So uh, let's use this time for a question and answer period. Uh, please put your questions into the question and answer box. And if you want to direct them at a particular speaker, please say so in, in the Q&A. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start us off. Uh, with a question for Leo. Um, Leo, thanks again for the great talk. Um, I'm going to ask you to prioritize for us a little, uh, which alien fish species are considered the most ecologically hazardous in the Netherlands and Belgium? Well, that's, uh, thanks very much for your question. Um, I think in general, uh, gobies are considered uh, as a, quite a problematic species because of the uh, the interaction and competition with uh, other small benthic species that we have. Uh, on the other hand, uh, topmouth gudgeon is considered a uh, pseudorasbra is considered a, a big problem, but mostly because of its uh, uh, its function or its role as a vector of uh, of disease. Um, but I don't know whether there's real consensus on it, but go gobies at the, at the moment are, are, are in, at the center of attention. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And Tim, uh, similarly, um, which aquatic invasive species are having the biggest impact on biodiversity from your perspective? Well, I'm not a fish biologist, so I should probably choose another one. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't have that answer, uh, I'm afraid. I can tell you that uh, very few um, alien aquatic species have actually been risk assessed in my country, but um, I, I would tend to go for a weed. I still think that weeds are the worst and uh, New Zealand pygmy weeds is certainly one that uh, everyone is currently worried about. But of course, it's more of an amphibian um, amphibious plant species than, than a real freshwater aquatic, although uh, the species is so flexible that it also uh, can be entirely submerged uh, during its entire life cycle. But um, Crashula helmsii is probably uh, our main problem to tackle for the moment. Okay, thank you for that. Now I am keeping my eye on the clock. Um, and I see that we're coming close to the end of our time today. So I would like to uh, thank you on behalf of the Invasive Species Center and our iCase co-hosts. 
Belgium's Research Institute for Nature and Forest and Netherlands Office for Risk Assessment and Research. I would like to thank Leo Nagelkerke of Wageningen University and Tim Adriens of the Research Institute for Nature and Forest for presenting today, and uh, especially to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, and in the spirit uh, of collaboration that the iCase conference series is known for, Leo and Tim have agreed to share their email addresses, and you can see them on the slide that I have up right now. Uh, so if you have any questions that we didn't have time for today, please do send them an email or you can save them for the networking uh, times at the iCase conference. Um, the webinar was recorded and it'll soon be posted on the Invasive Species Center website, uh, invasivespeciescenter.ca. Uh, and we will also share it on the iCase social media accounts. We hope that you enjoyed it and hope to continue the conversation and see you at iCase 2022, be it virtually or in person in Ostend, Belgium. Thank you.